It's time we got upscaling. Introducing Cosmic Clarity Super Resolution. Welcome to SETI Astro. But before we get to the actual Cosmic Clarity upscaling tool, let's go ahead and talk some theory. Let's just spell the arc second per pixel myth too. That's that's a bunch of malarkey. But let's cover some, some kind of basic equations here. We have the resolution of your CMOS camera, it's or CCD. It's gonna be in arc seconds per pixel, and it's roughly 206 times the pixel pitch divided by the focal length of your lens. Then we have something called the Dawes limit. We're gonna cover this as, as well with some graphical illustrations, but that's measured in arc seconds. And it's roughly 116 divided by the aperture of your objective. So the limiting resolution of your lens is strictly based on aperture. Then we have something called Nyquist-Shannon theorem. It basically says for a perfect sine wave, if you sample it twice as often as the frequency of the sine wave itself, you could perfectly replicate that sine wave. The problem is our data in our telescopes is not a perfect sine wave in space. Um, there's a multitude of uh, spatial frequencies. So the two samples really isn't gonna cut it. I'm using three here just as an illustration, which will be the Dawes limit divided by three. Dawes limit divided by four may even be better to get you properly sampled. And then uh, everybody knows the F ratio of their telescope. It's just the focal length divided by the aperture. But some interesting things we could do here with these equations is we could set the, the Nyquist limit and the CMOS resolution limits equal to each other. Doing so, we could uh, get this 116 over the aperture times three equals the 206 pixel pitch over the focal length, but we could just rearrange all this stuff and we end up with an equation. And I haven't seen this written anywhere. I don't know why people haven't like talked about this, but it's, it's, it's roughly 5.3 times your pixel pitch of your camera is going to equal the F ratio of the limit of your system. So that, that's it. it. It's completely dependent on the pixel pitch of your camera, what F ratio is the limit of your system. So I, I put in some common pixel pitches. 3.7 micrometers is, is probably the most common pixel pitch of cameras. And in that case, the limit of your, your optical system is about F20. And almost nobody shoots at F20 with the exception of planetary imagers and solar imagers. Those guys know what's up. You need a very high F ratio if you want to reach the limits of your optical system. And then I got some other ones here too. Uh, if you have a pixel pitch of like 4.6, an F ratio of about 25 is where you're actually getting the limit of your, your system. And if you have really tiny pixels like 2.3, then an F ratio of about 12. Let's uh, just look at some common uh, telescopes out there that everybody knows. Hubble is at F24. JWST is at F20. The big Keck telescope is at F15. And Gemini is at F16. You know, these two are huge optical ground-based telescopes. I can assure you they're way tinier than an arc second per pixel, right? Big F ratios, tiny pixels on huge sensors, just giant. So let's, let's forget this arc second per pixel thing and, and let's show it graphically. So on the screen here is a simulation of an airy disk of a star, right? Um, due to the wave nature of light, nothing's gonna be crisp and sharp. So the actual stellar profile will have a large central bright hump and then dimmer rings uh, kind of spreading out from there. If you were to sample this at one arc second per pixel, assuming you're seeing is about one arc second, uh, you, you may get something like this. It's just 
a, bl a block in the middle, right? Maybe maybe two by two or even one by one pixel. Um, I guess you could tell there's a star there, right? Uh, but if you if you did sample it more, and, and I had the three X sample, right? This is better of how it would be sampled. Uh, this would be the three times the the Dawes limit essentially. But let's talk about that Dawes limit. This is a simulation of the airy disks of two objects separated by the Dawes limit. Uh, you could uh, tell that it is two separate objects, even though they're kind of overlapping. You're kind of getting an oblong blob in the middle with kind of two brighter, brighter peaks. This was said about a long time ago by Mr. Dawes and how well he could optically, with his eyeball, resolve uh, binary stars. And he, he made up he made up this limit, right? But this is this is the simulation of the Dawes limit. Now, assuming these are separated by one arc second, let's go ahead and sample this uh, image here at one arc second per pixel. Oh great. It it's just the same blob star that we saw for a single star. You can't even tell that it's an it's an oblong object at all. And again, let's go look at uh, the single star, here's the single star. It's just brighter squares in the middle. Uh, and, you know, this star could just be a, a brighter star. You, you can't tell anything. So you're going to have to sample it more than the Dawes limit, even at a separation of your seeing of one arc second. Uh, and again, this is three times that sampling rate. And now you can see that it is an oblong feature. You, you really can't tell if it's two stars or maybe just kind of an oblong galaxy thing or something, right? Who, who knows? We didn't sample it enough to actually discern the Dawes limit yet. And this is even at three times the, the sample frequency of the common, the common guidance of one arc second per pixel. And again, that's assuming these are separated by one arc second. So that would be roughly you're seeing. So if you want to actually be sampling frequently enough to resolve the smallest features in your optical train, you really need to be up at that F20 ratio. But everything would be so dim, uh, we'd never get any imaging done, right? So that's where things like drizzling come into play and my cosmic clarity, super resolution upscaling as well. Drizzling has its own pros and cons. I could probably make a whole video on, on drizzling, but you know, the cons being you're going to sacrifice signal to noise ratio. You also sacrifice the ability to use rejection algorithms. So during the actual uh, drizzling process where it's dropping values onto the, the larger pixel grid, there's, there's no rejection in there. You may have some weighting schemes based on measurements of the initial images, but there's no rejection algorithms, regardless of what you have selected, like in PixInsight or Serial or whatever. There's, there's no rejection there. The pro is, if you have enough images, you're going to get essentially double your F ratio resolution. So if you're imaging at F5 and your Drizzle 2x and you have enough images to properly sample the entire uh, Drizzle map, you get an image out roughly at the, the F10 resolution, but with a lot of the additional signal of actually imaging at F5. So it is very, very good for that. But even at F10, we're a far cry from the limit of your optical system of roughly F20. And that's where cosmic clarity super resolution is really gonna come in. I wanna talk about what Cosmic Clarity Super Resolution is and what it is not. What it is not is some generative AI that's essentially making up a bunch of data to, to fill in the gaps, right? I, I know there's some Super Resolution programs out there that really is a, a generative AI. What this really is, is a neural net assisted upscaling interpolation. So just like you can have by cubic or nearest neighbor or Lacazo upscaling. What this does is take that upscaled image and assist in that interpolation. I actually trained it by 
taking my astronomical data, downsampling it to destroy data, right? If you, if you downsample 2x, you destroy 75% of your data. And then I just upscaled it back to the original resolution. So now it's at the proper resolution just with data missing, right? That was already interpolated uh, by the, the normal upscaling methods. And then I just trained the neural net to take that image and reconstruct the actual for real resolution. So it, it really just assists in the upscaling process to try to achieve that added resolution that you would miss uh, during normal upscaling. And where that's really going to show is if you do it prior to any sharpening, if you run Cosmic Clarity upscale first, and then use something like Blur Exterminator or Cosmic Clarity, now it has those additional pixels to go ahead and actually do the deconvolution. So here's the Eagle Nebula. Uh, this was just one example, and I ran uh, Blur Exterminator on the uh, default settings of it. And then I did the Cosmic Clarity upscaling and ran the same Blur Exterminator settings. And this is what we get out of the Eagle Nebula now. So much more detail, smaller, rounder stars, and just detail everywhere. Again, here's the before and the after. That's the power of combining upscaling with methods of deconvolution to try to get your images to the actual resolving power of your optical system. So where to get the new Cosmic Clarity Super Resolution? Just head on over to SETIastro.com under Astro Programs Cosmic Clarity. Uh, it's, it's bundled with all the other Cosmic Clarity tools I have. Sharpening, denoising, satellite trail removal. So just get the, the latest version. Uh, you can just go to the parent drive folder and, and download it for your operating system. And along with the other sliders I have showing the, the functionalities, at the very bottom is this uh, eagle example that we've been uh, that we've been covering. The other thing you're going to want to do is update your SETI Astro Suite. So head over to the SETI Astro Suite and click Get It Here to get the newest version. When you download the new Cosmic Clarity, you'll see a new executable SETI Astro Cosmic Clarity Super Resolution. You could either run it from here or from SETI Astro Suite. Let's just cover it here first. It's a pretty simple interface. You select your input file, you select your output directory, and then the output file type fits 32-bit floating and your upscale factor. Uh, word of caution, uh, your file sizes are going to go up as the square of the upscale factor. So if you have it on 2x upscale, the file is going to be four times bigger. If you have it on 4x, it's going to go 16 times larger. And then all you got to do is click uh, Run Upscaling. And you can see here, uh, there'll be a progress bar as it's running the upscaling for you. It is uh, GPU accelerated. And if you have it on really big files uh, and you're upscaling it by a lot, it, it, it may take a little bit. And then to run it from the newest SETI Astro Suite, uh, it'll be under the Cosmic Clarity tab. So you could just open an image I'll just open this small one here. Under cl Cosmic Clarity, where you had Sharp and Denoise or both, there's now the Super Resolution Upscaling. You just click that and um, tell it to execute. And then it's going to go ahead, and if it's a color image, it will have to run through each color channel for the upscaling. And it's done. Now I have an image that's uh, twice as large uh, with that neural net assisted uh, interpolation. And again, where this is really going to have the biggest impact is if you run this when it's still linear prior to any deconvolution. That's going to allow the deconvolution algorithms or neural net just those additional pixels to try to sharpen and get the most out of your image. You could always run it at the, the very end for your final image too if you want, but I think this is I think where this is really going to shine here is galaxy season. Everybody's coming into galaxy season. A lot of galaxies are very small. 
there's also a huge amount of small robotic telescopes out there now too. And I think they would benefit hugely from some super resolution upscaling along with drizzling to get you closer to that F20 sweet spot that is the true limit of your, of your optical train. Well, I hope you guys get a lot of use out of this. Please comment, like, and subscribe.